This video is the third video uh, looking at what colonial life was like in the 18th century or the 1700s. In this third video, we'll look at what 18th century education, language, and literature was like. There was some notable improvement in education from the 17th to the 18th century. In the South, in both centuries, uh, there were fewer number of institutions. They, they had a scattered population, fewer towns, so it, it made sense. If you were poor in the South, you usually only received a smattering of formal education. If you were lucky, you'd be apprenticed out to learn a skill. The responsibility for education in the South was with the family. Uh, if you were wealthy earlier in the colonial period, you might send your, your kid out to uh, the England, and if most, most plantations, however, would hire tutors with their children, which you can see in this slide. By the 18th century, there was the beginning of some private elementary and secondary schools. The middle colonies were famous for their number and the quality of these private elementary and secondary schools, certainly more in the South, more than in the South. Not surprisingly, it was New England where the idea of publicly funded schools really took off. And again, it's not surprising because you think of the Puritans and their emphasis on community and religion. In the 17th century, the Massachusetts government required all townships to establish town schools or grammar schools that would uh, teach at the elementary school age. They were tax supported, though through a, a modest fee was often charged as well. This idea of public funding for education was radical. It wasn't in England, for example. In the 18th century, as towns became larger and their population dispersed, it became impossible for all children to attend one town school. They first then tried moving the school around from town to town, then locating it at given locations over the year. This didn't work either, however, since it was meant that children only went to school a small portion of the year. By the end of the 18th century, therefore, towns had begun to divide themselves into school districts, each with its own taxing power to support its own schools. The most notable change for ed in education from the 17th to the 18th century was, a, was in what was taught. In all colonies, you begin to see a drift away from the purely classical education, Latin, Greek, philosophy, and so forth, to more of a useful education, things like surveying and geography, navigation, and for boys, bookkeeping, and for girls, drawing, needlework, and spinning. But it's still, we will... We, it still is in what we might call today vocational training. Anyway, in all colonies, religion was closely aligned with education. There was no separation of church and state. Also, of course, different educations existed for girls and boys throughout the colonial period. Overall, discipline for children could be harsh uh, throughout the colonial period. But the, the concept of childhood began to change from the 17th to the 18th century. 17th century Americans assumed childhood ended at about the age of six or seven. Afterwards, children were seen as like miniature adults. This is best indicated by their change of dress. Before the age of six or seven, both sexes wore long, loose robes. But after six or seven, they uh, wore clothes sort of emulating their parents. Girls had full skirts and even had corsets and gloves and, if they were wealthy, high-heeled shoes. And for boys, they wore knee breeches, uh, formal jackets, and on formal occasions, they might even wear wigs. In daily living, you really, honestly, the mo most colonists just used hand-me-downs from generation to generation. In the 18th century, people began to have a more liberal interpretation of childhood. Now, it's, you don't see people th seeing a child playing as thinking that, that that child was lazy or depraved. Uh, children weren't expected to be as productive as adults. So you allowed time at school for uh, to play, and, and you begin to see things like play clothes and uh, clothes that were easier fitting. Children's stories began to appear in the 18th century. For example, a bestseller was Gulliver's Travels. Another was The Adventures of Robinson Crusoe, Stranded on an Island. 
For small children, there were mother goose tales. Adulthood was considered about the age of 16. At that point, boys became eligible for the militia and girls for marriage. About the time that menstruation began for girls, uh, as the years passed, the age of onset of menstruation dropped, and uh, so children, be girls began to be married out younger age. If a colonist were wealthy, they might send themselves, uh, they might send their children to uh, one of the growing number of colleges. Higher education was certainly expanding in the 18th century. In the 17th century, the 1600s, there were really only two colleges. One was Harvard. It was the first real college in the United States, founded in 1636. And uh, it was founded as a religious school uh, and, and founded in large part because a, a Bostonian named John Howard laughed, left half of his estate to, to build the school outside Boston. The other school that was founded uh, in the 17th century was in Virginia. 1693, the College of William and Mary was founded by Anglicans as a way to teach the Indians their religion. And you can see the Christopher Wren building that designed by the famous 17th century architect Christopher Wren, and it's still standing today on the College of William and Mary's campus. But it was in the 18th century when higher education really took off. In 1701, Elihu Yale gave 800 pounds worth of goods to establish a new college in New Haven, Connecticut. It was founded because he thought that Harvard had gotten too liberal, too far from its strict puritanical uh, founding. About 50 years later, King's College was founded in uh, New York City, which of course now is Columbia College. And about the same time, 1750s, the College of Philadelphia was founded, and that now is the University of Pennsylvania. Ten years after that, in the 1760s, you have the College of Rhode Island, now Brown University, and also the founding of what is today Dartmouth College. These are obviously the foundations for the Ivy League today, and you might note that they're all in the north. All colleges, despite their growing number in the 18th century, remained small. At the end of the colonial period, Harvard was the largest, and it only had 180 students. Most had less than 100 students, and almost all, as I've said, came from the upper classes, as you would expect. Related to the development of education was the development of language, which dramatically changed as the 18th century wore on. With the 18th century, you really begin to see the development of an American English, distinct from what was spoken in England. You have certainly earlier periods words borrowed from Native Americans and other, colony, other colonies nearby from other countries, but this really began to grow in the uh, 18th century. Words came from the Germans and French uh, as their numbers increased in the 18th century. From Germans came words like dollar and pretzel and sauerkraut, and from the French words like chowder and cafe and prairie. Some English words died out in England but were retained in colonies. For example, uh, deft or nate or bub, which was a way of saying uh, boy. One reason for new words was the necessity of finding names for many of the new plants and animals that were found in the new world didn't have names. Sometimes an English word was mi misapplied to meet this need. That uh, is why you get bison uh, became known as buffalo and our maize became known as corn or the red-breasted thrush became known as a robin. More often, plants or animals were named by combining two descriptive words. For example, the blue bird or the ground hog or the egg plant or the cat fish or the bullfrog. In some cases, Americans simply coined new words or phrases out of the blue sort of the real Americanisms. Terms like handy and chunky, and the Americans used the word fall, where in Britain they used the word autumn. In discussing this evolution, we need to note that language is always changing, and it always differs col uh, colloquially according to various regions. In some instances at this time, rural English counties differed from the more standard English than they did parts of the colonies. You think of the different accents, the Irish, the English, or the Welsh.
Also, think of the debate uh, that took place among different usage between proper English or uh, the, the more poor use of English in the, in the poverty areas. You think of, as well, the, uh, accents and dialects in America. In the South, for example, they say, ah, instead of I. And in New England, they say, a is ah. There was also tremendous development of literature in the American colonies from the 17th century to the 18th century. In the 17th century, the 1600s, much of what was written in America was promotional, or memoirs, or religious-oriented. For example, the Puritans showing their faith in God and so forth. By the 18th century, Americans were becoming more rational and secular in their literature. You begin to see more distinctive forms of American literature. For example, the Almanac. By the 18th century, the Almanac was second to the Bible in American sales. It was a collection containing monthly calendars, information about the weather or tides or farming methods, recipes, you know, advice largely aimed at housewives and farmers, and it, it even contained spices, uh, spiced up rather with, with uh, poems or, uh, you know, amusing tidbits, cartoons. The most famous, of course, was published by Benjamin Franklin and became known as Poor Richard's Almanac. By the 18th century, you also begin to see the development of plays and playwriters. Uh, despite this development, however, columnists throughout the 17th and 18th century produced relatively few works of purely literary nature, or, or fiction, you might say, novels. Those who could read would import those works from England. A, a number of English authors were popular throughout the colonial periods, and the wealthy in America really jacked up their sales in these books. Uh, their sales skyrocketed in America. The 18th century, you begin to see the first colonial towns organizing public, or at least semi-public libraries. Most, although supported by revenue uh, in part from taxes, only had a collection of books. They were also tend to be housed in poor facilities. New York City had its the, the best library, and it it organized at the famous New York Public Library, uh, which today is huge. It, it was organized in, in 1730. By the 18th century, you also begin to see the first time the development of American newspapers. The first successful newspaper appeared in Boston in 1704. It was known as the Boston News Le uh, Letter, and was shown is shown here. By 1732, Philadelphia, New York City, Newport, and Charleston all had at least one paper as well. Thirty years after that, by 1763 in total, the colonies had 23 newspapers, with 37 by the time of the Revolution, only 13 years later. So there's obviously a tremendous rapid growth in the number of newspapers. To most colonists, the most interesting parts were the advertisements for goods, medicines, land, or runaway slaves, or even wives, because the rest was simply European news. Uh, it had been brought over by the ships, and uh, you know it was often dated. There were also the arrival, the anticipated arrival of ships, which uh, meant a lot to people. They could congregate on the uh, wharfs and and meet it and get and see what the ships were carrying. For most of the 18th century, papers were very short, usually only, only no more than, four, say, four pages or so, and they came out only once a week. Right before the revelation, rev revelation the revolution, however, you begin to see uh, more substantive daily newspapers in major cities. Uh, you begin to see, by the, by the time of the revolution, the beginning of political cartoons in these newspapers as well. Most newspapers were conservative. Otherwise, the authorities wouldn't have allowed them to publish. Now, this was challenged, however, in 1734 in New York with the famous case of John Peter Zinger, which began to show the development of a separate American jurisprudence, a separate American uh, press law. John Peter Zinger was a, a publisher who criticized the royal governor of New York. English law said newspapers couldn't print criticism of officials or you'd face libel charges, decided not by juries, but by official judges. 
which always uh, said quickly that you know the, the newspaper was guilty. In America, however, the, uh, the these such court cases were were tried in front of juries, and in the case of John P. or Zinger, uh, they ruled that Zinger was acquitted of libel because what he had said about the crown, the jury said was true, and you couldn't be convicted of libel if you said something that was demonstrably true. So that really gets, it really builds up the idea of free speech and uh, freedom of the press there. So it's, it's obviously an important case. Don't think, however, that just because of the Zinger case, colonial newspapers still had the, the freedom of press. Colonial governors could still just come in automatically and shut down the newspaper uh, regardless of any reason at all. I would add that they were uh, no real magazines as we might know them today. Benjamin Franklin tried to start one in the 1740s, but it had failed within a, a year. This concludes the, uh, the third video on the uh, development of education and language and, and literature.